Now this is a process that we call a disease sprint, and we're gonna show you how we explore a uh, disease sprint for a very um, challenging disease. It's one of the most devastating diseases in the world, and it's called glioblastoma. Now glioblastoma, as you may be familiar, um, takes, has taken the lives of some people that you know, like Senator John McCain, um, Bo Biden, and a, my, my friend, my noble friend, um, UK Cabinet Minister Tessa Zhao. After a vibrant career that spanned over 40 years in public service, Tessa lost her fight to an aggressive form of brain cancer called glioblastoma multiforme. I want to share with you a clip of her last speech in the House of Lords. Just briefly, Just briefly. what happened to me? I got into a taxi, but I couldn't speak. I had two powerful seizures. I was taken to hospital. Two days later, I was told that I had a brain tumor. Less than 2% of cancer research funding is spent on brain tumors. And no new vital drugs have been developed in the last 50 years. Glioblastoma, or GBM as it's called, is a savage disease. It's the most common of all brain tumors. According to the US National Cancer Institute, 23,000 new cases were diagnosed here in the United States alone in 2018. And we lost 16,000 patients to the disease. Without treatment, a patient normally dies within three months. With an aggressive combination and a brutal protocol, including chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, some patients survive around a year, which is how long Tessa survived before she lost her fight. Today, I wanna give you a look into a behind the scenes way in which we look at this disease. We try to look at radical new ways of understanding this disease um, across all kinds of domains, all uh, scientific domains, bringing all those experts together in a disease sprint that we're currently running for glioblastoma. To help me do that, I'd like to invite three of my colleagues to the stage, Jamie, Pujita, and Ollie. Hi. Uh, I'm Jamie. I'm a senior product manager at Benevolent. So what I do is I bring the science and the technology together and build the platforms that we use to do things like disease prints and uncover better treatments for this disease. Hopefully I'm going to show you what that looks like in action today. Hi, I'm Pujita. I'm a drug discovery scientist. And today I'm going to talk to you about how we are applying our machine learning models to find new medicines for the discovery programs we have. And hi, I'm Ollie. I'm a machine learning engineer at Benevolent. I helped to create the algorithms that read up these papers from the millions of articles Joanna was talking about. And I'm going to talk and interrupt a little bit about the, about the technology we use as we go on. <laughs> so, Petita, you've been studying cancer for over a decade, um, specifically glioblastoma. Can you tell us a little bit more about the disease? Right. So, glioblastoma, as you said, is the brain tumor with the highest severity. It usually starts with persistent headaches, nausea, and like uh, memory loss and onset of seizures. So what happens is that it usually starts in one part of the brain, uh, but the tumor infiltrates the neighboring tissues and spreads really rapidly. Although it's, uh, like we saw, it's quite common in older patients, it doesn't discriminate the age. So young patients also get GBM. And uh, yeah, so uh, scientifically, how GBM occurs and why GBM, have, like why do patients get glioblastoma is very poorly understood. And uh, yeah, so treatment wise, what we have is, like you said, surgery is the best treatment. So we remove the tumor with the surgery and followed by chemo and radiation therapy. Uh, but most of the GBMs usually recur, so patients get the tumors back again in time. So I, you have to wonder why despite so many years of research, there's still no effective treatment protocol for yeah. GBM. And it's because it's such a heterogeneous disease and it's so complicated. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, actually, yeah, I think it's important for us to stop and think why it's hard to find 
I mean, why is it untreatable still, yeah. right? So let's think of it in three main points. Like the first one, GBM is quite complex and diverse. No two patients are similar. The genetic makeup is completely different and the cancer is evolving and adapting over time. So to find a one drug that's going to work for the patient all the time is next to impossible. So that's one of the first things. And second, the tumor is in the brain, right? So you need to make drugs that are able to penetrate your brain. And we're all, we all have something called as the blood-brain barrier, which the essential function of that is to avoid harmful toxins from entering our brain. So making drugs that actually penetrate your brain is extremely challenging, and that's why many drugs fail in the clinical trials. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the reason it's so difficult to come up with a treatment for glioblastoma is there's so many factors. First and foremost is the glioblastoma stem cells are hard to treat because of this blood-brain barrier challenge. It's hard to develop a medicine that will penetrate that. Yeah, yeah, so it's good that you bring up that. So, uh, yeah, the third one was the glioblastoma stem cells, right? So you have a tumor, you do the surgery, and you treat them, uh, you give chemotherapy and radiation therapy. This removes most of the tumor, but you're still left with some cells in your brain, right? So the worst of them is the glioblastoma stem cells. Why they're so bad is because these stem cells are extremely hard to target. They're buried within your tumor, so it's really challenging to remove them all. And these glioblastoma stem cells have the capacity to actually recreate the whole tumor from scratch over time. So leaving even one behind is quite lethal. So with all the information that's published on glioblastoma, I think there's something like 800 clinical trials going on at the moment. Um, how do you as a researcher um, you know, try to make sense of all that information in a traditional environment? Right, so before my life in Benevolent, I was uh, doing my uh, medical research. So typically what we do is when we have a disease, we spend about like two to three months trying to read up about the disease, reading the, I mean, reading the literature and all the reviews that's out there. And probably the best I could manage is maybe like 20 to 30 papers and uh, on the disease. But you continuously have to read and keep yourself up to date with everything that's published. And like we said, there are about 10,000 papers that's being published every day, so it's almost impossible to read all of them and keep them in your mind and actually be able to make inferences on top of it. So yeah, that's quite challenging. So when you're thinking, um, when you're researching a heterogeneous disease like that, you know, the complexity of the terrain, you know, the amount of information that's being published, all those things make it really challenging for researchers and scientists to come up with, um, you know, to formulate new hypotheses and come up with new ways to treat that disease. So I'd like to turn this over next to Jamie, who will talk about how we, you know, through the benevolent platform makes sense of all that scientific data and helps scientists come up with more refined hypotheses that will help us actually treat the disease. So, I mean, that's exactly what the genesis of Benevolent was like. We wanted to have this audacious goal to build what we consider to be the world's largest biomedical uh, knowledge base. And the idea is we could apply this then to find those treatments for the diseases like GBM. So, what I want to show you was um, this knowledge base contains everything that we consider to be important in terms of that research. So, we talked a lot about that information, right? Diseases, genes. In fact, I think there's 22 different types of entity in this knowledge base that we have. Um, and over one billion relationships between these, uh, um, these relationships between these entities. And I think the important piece here is the context and how we pull that all together. So what we did was, uh, well, what I've been doing in the company for the last three years is build a platform on top of that to answer two fundamental questions. One of those is give me everything I need to know about a disease like GBM in a way that's more than 20 to 30 papers, but literally everything that I care about and show it in a way that's meaningful because that's the starting point. And the second part of the platform, which we'll show a little bit later, kind of as part of the disease sprint, is identify the gaps between the information because that's where we think the answers are uh, around that information. So I'm gonna try and show you uh, live what the system looks like, uh, at least for the first part of that question. So I've got my handy laptop here. Hopefully the hamsters are rolling. Let's see what it looks. So, yeah, you can see it on there. Okay, so the idea is if you take um, the task that Pajita had in mind, right, thinking of all this information, what we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to build parts of the, uh, parts of the platform that allowed us to give that snapshot of, of research around glioblastoma. So I can do this and I can type in something like glioblastoma. 
But bear in mind that I could do this for any of the diseases that we have in our knowledge graph, because what we want to do is be disease agnostic and do this for multiple different times with different types of diseases. You can see I can click on this button, and what it will do is it will give me all of the context and all the information around glioblastoma. And it starts off very simple because this is going to be used by a scientist. So you see here you've got a number of, uh, a number of connections that are in our knowledge graph. Joanna talked about these clinical trials. You can see these, these are ongoing uh, and um, completed clinical trials around the particular disease. Things are important, like understanding what chemistry we've already tested against the disease. Even the underlying biology about that disease is fundamentally important. Yeah, and it's, I think we really should take a moment to know that for someone like me who comes from a very biological research background, getting this information was super valuable. Like, it, it looks at everything, the clinical trials, the chemistry, and everything. So you don't need to be an expert to know all of these. So going in, I get all the information that I require for any disease that I'm looking at. So in this instance, glioblastoma is one of the examples we are showing. So Yeah, and I think it's important to, to illustrate that the information comes from very different uh, yeah. data sources, right? So the idea here is we want to have that unbiased view. Yeah. So some of it comes from curated, proprietary, and public data sources where we've extracted that information. But a significant proportion comes from those papers, the unstructured data that we care about. Yeah, so that unstructured data are these scientific articles that Pajita was talking about earlier. So the language in those articles is quite different to, to how it would be in a newspaper or elsewhere. It's quite complex, and we use natural language processing algorithms, machine learning algorithms, that can recognize concepts and information that we care about. We're not really reading those articles per se. I don't want to overhype uh, AI uh, too much. Um, but they, what they do is they recognize the kinds of language that scientists use to describe important information and they're transforming it inf into information that can be read by other machines. And I'm going to show you a little bit what that looks like later. For now, it's enough to say that about a third of all the relationships in our database have come only from the literature, so they couldn't have come from anywhere else. Yeah, and that's incredibly important. As a starting point, though, what we want to do is obviously, this is just a bunch of numbers at this stage. We want to give a snapshot of that information. So I can click on the name here, glioblastoma. And what that does is it takes us to what is an overview page for uh, GBM. And the idea was we designed these overview pages in order for us to understand that entire sort of view of glioblastoma. And these pages, uh, and what's something that we are quite passionate and benevolent about, is built with scientists and technologists hand in hand. So as we build these, we get the feedback from, those, from the drug discoverers and researchers, as well as making sure that it's concise information. So things like understanding recent reviews that we care about in terms of the disease, the associated drugs that we know are existing, the symptoms, and even the aggregated information around the clinical trials uh, is very important for us. And as we mentioned before, this means that it comes from a lot of different data sources, so it's trying to be unbiased. If we, if we pause here for a second, I want to kind of uh, touch on a point, uh, looking at something like uh, clinical trials. There's 800 ongoing clinical trials. A large majority of them are in this phase two. So phase two, probably around seven to 10 years of research has gone up to the stage in tens of millions of dollars, right? That is a long time and a lot of information, but we're still at a stage where we don't quite have an effective treatment. So there's something fundamental that we need to change about this process. But more importantly, we know that within this body of research, there is something um, that is going to be the idea that's going to take us forward that we can actually start to optimize for.